Well, good afternoon. As we see this new surge in COVID-19 cases, as we see the second wave of this virus, we're taking action. My friends, over the last few days, we've seen me up here every single day talking about the fall preparedness plan. We have the most robust, the most extensive plan for the second wave of COVID-19 in the entire country. We're spending a billion dollars to expand testing and contact tracing. We're hiring 3,700 more frontline healthcare staff. We're clearing the backlog of surgeries with an investment of $243.7 million. And we're freeing up hospital beds. And most importantly, we're protecting our most vulnerable. Today, we're announcing further action to protect our seniors. An additional $540 million to protect our long-term care homes from COVID-19. That's more than a half a billion dollars we're spending and we're sparing no expense. This funding includes $405 million to help homes with containment measures, staffing supports, and purchasing additional supplies of PPE. $61.4 million for renovations in the homes to improve infection control, including ventilation and isolation capacity. $30 million for additional infection control staffing and training for existing staff. And we'll ensure every long-term care home has a two month supply of PPE. And as we find ourselves in this new wave, our government must continue to make tough but necessary decisions to protect our seniors. We have to take action now to protect those we care about most. That's why we have to make changes to the visitor policy for long-term care homes. We're looking at this highest risk regions, the areas with high community spread. We're working with the chief medical officer to identify those areas based on the data. My friends, this is not something that we take lightly. I know firsthand how hard it can be, but it's absolutely necessary. We can't let COVID-19 get into these homes. It's absolutely critical. That's why as of Monday, October the 5th, visitors to long-term care homes in these areas will have to be restricted to staff, essential visitors, and essential caregivers only. But folks, we have made it possible for family members or friends to come in as caregivers. This kind of support is critical, and I encourage family members, friends, please, please sign up to be a caregiver because showing up at a home for a few hours to help out, it's critical. It helps our loved ones and it can help other residents as well. It means more eyes and ears looking out for our residents. It's easy to register, so I highly encourage folks to take advantage of this because we must do everything we can to support those who are isolated during these difficult days. My friends, we're sparing no expense. We're putting up another half a billion dollars to fortify our long-term care homes against this virus for the sake of our long-term care residents, for the sake of their families. We will be there for them, we will protect them, and we will get through this. Thank you and God bless the people of Ontario. Now I'll hand it over to Minister Fullerton. Thank you, Premier. COVID-19 has impacted our lives, the likes of which we have never seen. Our daily lives have changed dramatically since this time last year. Our government has worked diligently since January to learn about and act against this virus, to keep Ontarians as safe as possible. And we couldn't have done it without the bravery and heroics of our frontline healthcare workers. We saw the impacts of wave one in our long-term care homes. We learned from it and we will continue under the leadership of Premier Ford to do whatever it takes to keep our loved ones in long-term care safe. As the Premier mentioned, effective Monday, October 5th, visitors to long-term care homes in these areas will be restricted to staff, essential visitors and essential caregivers only. We know the vital role that essential caregivers play in the lives of so many residents in our long-term care homes. Residents and substitute decision makers are encouraged to identify and ensure the designation is in writing for up to two individuals 
to be essential caregivers. Doing so will ensure the continuation of visits and support the physical and mental well-being of residents at the home. To ensure our long-term care homes are prepared to contain and prevent COVID-19, I'm pleased to announce our government's long-term care preparedness plan, which, as the Premier mentioned, includes new investments of over half a billion dollars to support our long-term care homes. That includes more funding to help homes with operating pressures related to COVID-19 prevention and containment measures, minor capital repairs and renovations to improve infection prevention and control, and the recruitment and training of additional frontline staff. Earlier this month, we also reconvened the Long-Term Care Incident Management System, or IMS structure. The IMS table will continue to meet to monitor the data and organize efforts to make rapid decisions that support long-term care homes in need. Supported by the Ministry of Health, we are continuing to implement our testing strategy in long-term care homes. And we are working to prioritize the delivery of high-dose flu vaccines to long-term care homes to protect our most vulnerable seniors. It's also important to look at innovative solutions to provide more care where and when people need it. Community paramedics have done outstanding work during this pandemic. They have run testing centers, provided support in our long-term care homes, and provided countless support in other activities. Building upon these successes, we will be making an investment in community paramedicine to help those on the long-term care wait list stay in their own homes longer where they want to be. Our personal support workers have always and will continue to be the backbone of our long-term care homes and broader healthcare system. Our government is also expanding the pool of available, available PSWs and registered clinical staff through several incentive programs that will see the addition of over 2,000 healthcare workers join our long-term care homes. As the Premier has said before, we will continue to act to keep Ontarians safe, especially our loved ones in long-term care. With this investment of over half a billion dollars, our government is delivering on that promise. Thank you. We'll go to the phone line for questions. Well, just, actually, oh, just, yep. just okay. before uh, we get started, folks, I, I want to give a uh, shout out to uh, Max Cochiella, Sarah Vino, and their kids, Alice and Jonathan, for designing these beautiful masks. You know, and, and I remember my MPP, Rudy Cazetto, gave me this mask a little while ago. And uh, what, what great work. Uh, they're doing, they've partnered up with Canadian Heart of Hearing Association, along with Bob Murray from McRae Imaging. And these uh, these masks truly make a difference uh, for the folks, uh, hard of hearing community. And it, they, they made this at the kitchen kitchen table, you know, and, uh, you know, not only are they philanthropists, and these are pretty staggering numbers, they donated 500,000 to the Canadian Heart of Hearing Association. Then they committed to 25 million, I'm sorry, 25, that's a lot of change, 25 million. Uh, their first uh, donation was 5 million yesterday. And I, I just got to give a shout out to all the, the philanthropists out there. Um, you, you make a difference. I, I've seen people donating millions of dollars to hospitals and other associations and, and uh, like the Como Foundation uh, yesterday. Folks, so if you want to pick up a mask, it's going to a great cause. And uh, do, you, do you know who I, I, I loved meeting yesterday? I loved meeting the, uh, all the folks there, and, and they're doing a great job, obviously, at Trillium. Uh, Michelle, you're doing a fantastic job. But little Alice, so little Alice, about this high, and she was a fireball. And uh, they were uh, part of the family, and, and, and Jonathan, I know he was running around probably making masks, but... Uh, Alice stood there like the commander in chief and I told her Alice I need you on the next campaign so Alice there's a shout out for you honey and keep doing the great work and again I want to thank the the Como Foundation and all the other folks that are uh, making donations that's showing the true Ontario spirit so so thank you okay first question please your first question comes from Rob Ferguson with the Toronto okay. Star <laughs> 
Hi, Premier. Um, I just wanted to ask about this money for long-term care homes. Isn't it a bit late to be announcing money for renovations to improve their ventilation? Um, We've already seen the number of outbreaks increase quite a bit this month and the number of cases increase quite a bit this month. Yeah, well, Rob, what we're doing, uh, we're going full steam ahead, and it wasn't just now. We've announced uh, hundreds of millions of dollars even uh, before this announcement as you're aware of the the rapid builds that uh, we're we're putting together, and when I say rapid builds, we're starting from scratch, and with conjunction with the uh, labors and the in the cities, be it uh, Peel Region or City of Mississauga, uh, building uh, four uh, four long-term care homes. Each one will have 320 beds, state of the art. On top of the 640 beds we're doing in conjunction with um, Trillium and. Uh, so I, I think uh, we're, we're doing quite a bit, not to mention uh, all the other areas. And I'm going to pass this over to uh, the Minister of uh, Long-Term Care. Thank you. Thank you. So I think it's important to understand um, many of our homes across Ontario have not been in outbreak and have had no resident cases. And so the ability for those homes, especially the older ones, to upgrade and have additional measures, whether it's removing carpeting or adding uh, uh, something additional to the HVAC system to provide uh, an update for these homes to make sure that the infection prevention and control can be as robust as possible. So this is something that is another layer um, for these homes. And uh, I know that it's something that they've been um, they've been needing. So we're happy to provide that. Follow up. Okay, thank you. Just on the bigger picture, um, uh, in terms of staffing, um, I'm thinking it's going to be harder to get people to work in nursing homes and uh, given what may be coming again. And why are there still no uh, raises for the personal support workers? Well, all of this is on the table and you've heard the Premier mention about how our government values uh, the frontline workers, our personal support workers. They are truly heroes and it is their dedication, their commitment and their compassion that has helped keep our homes going through this this devastating COVID-19 era. And so they are absolutely valued and uh, we will continue to demonstrate um, their importance with, with future measures. Thank you. Okay, next question. Your next question comes from Cynthia Mulligan with City News. Please go ahead. Hi, Cynthia. Premier, hello. I'm wondering why you're making this announcement to recruit more staff in long-term care now. You've had months to do this since since the first wave hit and we saw the crisis that erupted. We're now into the second wave. Why didn't you try and recruit people weeks ago? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it into perspective. Uh, we, we saw these cases uh, take off, as I always say, like an Australian bushfire at the, the beginning. We brought uh, teams in. And I, again, I want to thank the Canadian military for for offering their assistance and coming in and, and supporting us. Um, then all of a sudden we saw a decline. And, and just to put this into perspective for the people watching today, we have close to 78,000 uh, residents in long-term care uh, right now. And I want to emphasize there's 78 cases and that's 78 too many. That's one-tenth of one percent. I, I think the minister has been doing an incredible job, the, the frontline folks there. So there's 78 uh, actual uh, cases, and, and then there's, I believe, 136 uh, healthcare workers that uh, that have uh, COVID as, as well. But we're, we're throwing every measure we can, and with the 3,700 additional uh, support uh, healthcare workers, it's going to make a difference. On top of that, for the caregivers, I encourage everyone out there, um, if you have a loved one in, in long-term care, uh, come in, step up, get the training. You know, I know Carla, my wife, she's in there every day. She took the training and and uh, it, it's a family in there We're, uh, over at West Park. Everyone knows everyone. I think the world of the PSWs and, and by the way, just stay tuned over the next couple of days. Uh, we're going to be supporting the PSWs in, in a much bigger uh, way because they're they're absolute champions. But we're we're moving uh, very quickly on on that, and we we you know something as we saw the first uh, outbreak happen, we made uh, tremendous measures, and we brought the cases right down. I remember days that there was zero cases, 
And the higher the community spread, the more of a chance it has to, to get into long-term care. As I always say, these long-term care patients aren't bringing it in. Uh, that's for sure. Um, it's uh, other people from the outside uh, bringing it in. But uh, we aren't uh, sparing any expense. A half a billion dollars into long-term care, 3,700 uh, new health care workers. And we're going to continue on top of that. We're re uh, revamping uh, the ventilation systems throughout all 626 homes. Bella? Thank you. I have many more on this topic, but I, I'm going to ask you a question for my colleague, Faiza Amin, right now. Uh, wait times at assessment centers are still hours long, and we're hearing people are waiting more than five days for results, which means they could be infecting more people while they wait, and sometimes they have to wait days to be able to sign up to go for a test. Have you lost control of the situation? Absolutely not. Like that's a hundred percent. I'll pass this over to the minister in a in a minute. Uh, there's no one that's been jumping up and down, uh, you know, screaming for the rapid test more than I have. And I had a very lengthy uh, discussion with the deputy prime minister on on Sunday, along with everyone except the pope was on the line. I was calling everyone across the board. Uh, I had a great conversation with the prime minister yesterday about the rapid test and uh, I'm very grateful that they were listening. Now Abbott's coming out with a rapid test today. Isn't, isn't that amazing? The announcement, I'm, I'm very grateful again to the Deputy Prime Minister and the Prime Minister for listening to our, our concerns. We're on the ground, we're out there, we're seeing what's happening, we're testing 40,000 uh, people uh, every single day. Some, sometimes it's a thousand behind, sometimes it's a couple thousand above but we're, we're just hammering out the test. You know, we're, we're up to, I think, close to 3.9 million people. We'll be hitting over 4 million uh, tests. And this rapid uh, test from Abbott is a game changer. It is, it's an absolute game changer. I can't, can't stress it enough that people are gonna be able to go uh, to additional pharmacies, different locations that have the testing equipment and get, get answers within minutes rather than than days, but you know something, I gotta give a shout out to all the lab technicians. They're, they're maxed out, uh, they've been working their, their backs off. I gotta give all the credit to the people doing testing across the province, uh, all the healthcare workers, you, you guys are champions. But uh, again, uh, all the whole country combined isn't even coming close to Ontario alone. We're doing more tests than everyone combined in, in Canada. So I'll, I'll pass it over to the minister, thank you. Thank you. Having access to the rapid tests is uh, going to help us enormously uh, as we try to increase the uh, amount of volumes of testing and, of course, the, the getting the uh, quick results is going to be really important. But we also knew that we were going to have a significant increase in testing volumes and prepared for that with our uh, Keeping Ontario and Safe plan to uh, both boost the testing capacity. As the Premier indicated, we've uh, tested over three and a half million on Ontarians already. We've gotten to the point now where we can process 40,000 tests per day and we're getting closer to 50,000 which is our next target. Uh, but of course as you're doing more testing you also have to have increased lab capacity. So we are working uh, on several fronts right now to uh, increase that so that there will be the vast majority of tests returned in uh, 24 to 48 hours. So we have uh, anticipated that, planned for it, uh, put it in our plan, and of course allocated the funds for it. We have received a billion dollars now to increase our test, trace, and isolate program to reduce community transmission. And uh, all that, along with the rapid access test, is going to help us uh, get further ahead very, very quickly. Next question. Your next question comes from Laura Stone with the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Hi, Laura. Hi, Premier. Hi. Just back to today's announcement, um, you're facing a lot of criticism from pretty much the entire long-term care industry, from infection control experts, unions, even the Long-Term Care Association, for not making these changes to prepare for a second wave sooner. They say they warned you in June, they say they're not ready. So what do you say to these critics who say that you should have made this announcement two months ago? Well, we made tremendous amount of, uh, you know, advancements within long-term care and the, the numbers speak speak for themselves. We, we were in a, a crisis when this first 
uh, happen, and we've come a long way, and we've been uh, making these plans for the last couple months, come a long way, no matter if it's ventilation or increased testing or making sure that the PSWs can work at one location. Uh, we closed down all visitors, then as things got better, we opened it up. Uh, we've been moving uh, like around the clock uh, on, on this. We've just increased PPE supply for eight weeks uh, for, for all long-term care homes to make sure they have plenty of PPE. Uh, we, we've, you know, something we've come a, a tremendous, tremendous way. And, and again, uh, you know, one tenth of 1%, in my opinion, that's one tenth too many, but put it into perspective, um, you know, they're, they're doing a great job. I'll hand it over to the minister and uh, Dr. Fullerton has been an absolute champion. I, I wouldn't want anyone else uh, heading up long-term care than, than Dr. Fullerton. She understands it, she gets it, and a shout out to the community paramedics. They're doing a great job as well. Thank you. Thank you, Premier. So your question is, could we have acted earlier? And, and I, I really want to go to the point that this was an evolving process, and there's many things that are different after the first wave. And thanks to the Premier, we have a, a good supply of PPE at this point. It took a tremendous effort. There was global competition for that. Uh, the leadership of, Pre of Premier Doug Ford made a huge difference in that. And uh, looking at the asymptomatic spread that wasn't recognized early, looking at all the different measures that we know now, which I, I won't list for, for a matter of time, but understanding that wave two is very different and our government is working multi-ministry. So there's not one thing that you do, you know, in, in this response that doesn't affect something else. And so we need to work in a coordinated effort with our scientific experts, with the command table experts, with our public health experts. And that's what we've been doing. And uh, this has never stopped. It, it does take time to get these things coordinated. But uh, we are getting uh, the support to our front lines, to our homes, and, and it is absolutely an imperative that we continue to do that, and uh, and we will do that. Follow up. And, and Premier, just on the rapid test, uh, you call it a game changer, but Health Canada has not yet approved it. So mm -hmm. what do you make of that fact, and do you still think Health Canada bears some of the blame for the testing backlog? in Ontario because it has been slow to approve these tests or do you have assurances from the federal government that it will be approved? Well, the, the assurance is that they're, they're working hard, they're working around the clock, Health Canada, and uh, I had that assurance from the Deputy Prime Minister and the, and the Prime Minister. Very simple, when I talked to the Prime Minister, he asked me how it was going. Uh, I started off and I didn't stop for 10 minutes and I didn't come up for a breath of fresh air. And uh, he was understanding. He, he's, he's a good listener. He listened to me. And, uh, and he came out and they're making the announcement today. So I know everyone's going to be working hard. All we need is, is answers. That, that's all I ask for until we can uh, plan appropriately. And again, we're uh, knocking off over 40,000 tests. We're going to ramp that up to 50,000 uh, tests. And we're, we're leading, leading the country, leading North America. Uh, to the exception of one state, by the way, I, I, what I do is I, I gauge all the provinces and the in the states. Uh, Illinois, they're they're testing quite a bit, but every other state, we're we're doing extremely well, much better than all of them actually. Next question. Your next question comes from Sean Jeffords with the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi, Sean. Good afternoon, Premier. Wanted to ask you uh, for some clarity around today's announcement regarding two things. Uh, specifically, you mentioned that the, these uh, changes will take place uh, in terms of the visitor restrictions to, to long-term care homes in hot spots. Now, are we to take from that that as of October 5th, it will be Toronto or the greater Toronto area and Ottawa? And I'm wondering if Minister Fullerton can explain the difference between essential caregivers and essential visitors and what will the testing requirements be so that these essential caregivers or visitors have access to their families? Yeah, I'll, I'll hand that over to uh, the minister and maybe uh, Dr. Williams can answer the, the question uh, about uh, the hotspots. Right now, there's no secret, it's Ottawa, Peel and Toronto that represent 80% of the cases. Think of that, 80% of the cases, Peel, Toronto and Ottawa. The big, big populations, it's, it's understandable. But uh, I'll pass it over to the minister. Thank you. Thank you. So the difference between an essential visitor and a general visitor. A general visitor might be someone coming to visit their loved one in long-term care. 
from out of town, someone that doesn't come very often. Uh, an essential visitor is someone who's coming in for potentially an end of life uh, visit with their loved one or some other essential aspect to the to that uh, that individual. An essential caregiver is someone who is designated and each resident is is uh, uh, encouraged to designate two people to be their essential caregiver. And they can come in during an outbreak, they can come, you know, come in without an outbreak, they need the training in donning and doffing of protective equipment and, uh, and they can be there whether it's to feed their loved one or to assist their loved one in some way or even to help uh, a, um, you know, other residents depending on the home circumstances. So the essential caregivers that will remain, the general visitors are being stopped right now uh, because of the, um, the rising cases. And, and it's very clear now that as the cases rise in the communities, um, that it gets harder and harder to keep cases out of long-term care. And maybe at this point, I'll ask Dr. Williams to comment on the, on the hotspots. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Mr. Fulton. And uh, as the Premier said, we have uh, working with our public health measures table and with our other tables to look at this, these regional issues, this variation we're seeing right now in this second wave, as compared to the first one where we had quite widespread cases throughout the province. Uh, we're seeing now a concentration over a period of time in certain areas as compared to others that may have some cases for a bit, but then they're back down to like the north with no cases the last two days reported. So we're trying to look at how we might designate those ones, look at our different metrics and numbers. As the Premier said, the obvious ones, uh, as you noted, around the GTA in Ottawa, and we're trying to uh, put in place those measures that would say, when are they gonna step up to a higher level of some activity, like with the visitors limitation at this time, and we're looking at the stipulations, how that would work, so that they would then limit those visitors but as the Premier and as the Minister said, we will continue to have essential workers and essential caregivers, staff of course, uh, with proper process and protocols in place to uh, attend to the needs of the uh, uh, citizens and the residents of those long-term care homes to ensure not only the safety and prevention from COVID, but also the other value-added processes that have been so, uh, are so meaningful and valuable at this time. So we'll be coming up with more information as far as how we designate si sites and zones and there may be others Hopefully not many added to it, but maybe we'll get that back down. And that means some can come out of being hot zones in the future as well. So it can go both ways. Well, what? Uh, yes, actually, a follow-up for uh, Premier Ford and Dr. Williams. I wanted to get both of your reactions to mm -hmm. um, the uh, comments made by Toronto's medical officer of health yesterday about social bubbles and how that concept, uh, given all of the increased numbers um, in the city of Toronto, and in other areas of the province isn't really working for Toronto specifically. Is the concept of the 10 person, person social bubble shot, is it done? I'll pass to Dr. Williams, thank you. Um, the, the concept of the original um, cohort or social bubble of the close family members is still one we, uh, we value. The question is, uh, have people maintained consistency and uh, I would say vigilance in maintaining that? We've seen a casualness and a movement away from that so that uh, people have had some in, some are connected with another one, and so it's become very much uh, less disciplined. And so we're concerned about that, and I know Dr. DeVille is concerned about that, and should we restrict that back down if people find it too difficult to stay with 10 and you find they're now with this group and they're with that group and there's many in the household that are not masking or using the six foot distancing who are not originally part of their family or their cohort group. They know that their children are going and be involved in a class cohort uh, at their school. So that adds an extra pressure there. Some have added a whole bunch of other things. So people have gone as we've seen in August, late August and early September, it's like, uh, we're doing great, let's just be casual and forget about the discipline, even of maintaining social bubbles. So we're looking at that again to say, can people be trusted to keep the 10? Do we have to reduce it a little bit more? So people will be consistent to say, the ones in your household, at least, you have to have that because you share the same facilities, you share the same bathrooms, that's understood. But you have to maintain the integrity of that during that time. Uh, we did that well at the start and people have gotten I think you know, some have continued to do well, and I applaud them for that. Others have said, it doesn't really matter too much, but you can see by the numbers, 
uh, people, it does matter. And so you have to do that, protect you, your family, your social bubble you had, as well as then those connected to that. So uh, refocus, get back in there again. If there's any further changes, as you know, we didn't increase the number of cohorts, except the ones related to school activities, but we're gonna see if there's any further recommendations from our public health measures table, especially in these hot zones, such as where the concern has been raised by Dr. Davila. Next question. Your next question comes from Lorinda Radikoff with CBC. Please go ahead. Hi there, following up on some of the questions about the situation in long-term care and the announcement. We've heard that a lot of PSWs have left the profession and many went on CERB. They didn't feel safe on the job. What are you doing to attract workers? Are you expecting some of these same workers who left to return to the profession? And why didn't you act sooner to keep these workers there? Well, for, first of all, uh, the PSWs are heroes, and I've said that from day one, and I always said they are overworked, underpaid, and we're going to address that in the next few days. Um, you know, I, I, I want to thank them, and I understand their, their concerns. Uh, they have one of the toughest jobs, in my opinion, uh, out there, especially in long-term care. Uh, there was concern about PPE. We were able to get through that hurdle. Matter of fact, that, 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 that was... Uh, a uh, massive, massive uh, gain for all the, the businesses that switched over to produce PPE. We have, uh, I was listening to some media and I, I'm thinking, I don't, know, I don't know where they're coming from, but we have uh, hundreds of, of millions of, of, of everything from gloves. They, they told me we have 105 million gloves. We have millions of N95s. So we ended up making sure long-term care has eight week supply of uh, PPE. We're also uh, hiring 3,700 more support uh, healthcare workers to, to help them out, uh, along with the caregivers. As, as uh, Minister Fullerton uh, mentioned, uh, with the, the caregivers, it's so important that people come in there with uh, a loved one and they get trained up and they, they pitch in and, and help out. And not only help out with your loved one, help out with another person that might not. If it's heartbreaking, and I know firsthand, as Carla tells me, some people don't get any visitors, none, like for months and months, and all of a sudden a family member shows up. Uh, that's heartbreaking. So everyone should pitch in. And uh, that, that's, that's so important. I'll, I'll pass it over to the minister. Thank you. And I want to mention that the dollars going uh, in this announcement will be able to provide, you know, hundreds potentially of IPAC um, specialists in the long-term care homes. So some homes have already started doing that, um, and we know that uh, that is working well, and other homes uh, do need more support, and that is why we're looking at the really a coordinated effort between the Ministry of Health and long-term care. And so we also know that Every time we do something in, in home care, PSWs, it can have an impact on long-term care and the PSWs in hospitals. So there does have to be an overall coordinated approach to this um, to understand that when we, we do something for one sector, what happens to the others? And looking at the PSW support, the training, um, ways to expedite the training, ways to support them in their training. This has been uh, ongoing since we started as a ministry, but it's you can't just produce you know, staff with a snap of your fingers. It does take time and, uh, and coordinated effort, and we're well on our way for that. So thank you for the question. Valva? Yeah, this is a, for a colleague, a story she's working on. CBC News has spoken with a student in Ottawa who tested positive but says no contact tracing was done on her case. She says no one from public health got in touch with her, and a week later, she was the one reaching out to her close contacts herself. And then another issue with the same case, when she initially tested positive, her information was sent to her parents' home region, and it was her mother contacting Ottawa Public Health, informing them that she actually lived there. So what's being done to address issues like this? Well, again, I'll just, I'll just run through what we're, we're doing, and I'll, I'll just start off with the fall preparedness plan. Uh, we put a billion dollars into testing and, and tracing, which is absolutely in imperative. Um, we, we also have the immunization uh, program for the flu vaccine, which is 5.1 million doses. That is the largest ever in, in Canadian uh, history. We have the backlog surgeries. We're putting $243.7 million 
they get uh, backlog surgeries caught up. Matter of fact, a gentleman that I know called me up and said, thank you. I went in for my surgery on Saturday because of the money you put forward for my knee replacement. Uh, we're hiring 3,700 more people. We've increased testing at pharmacies. We added 18 more as of today in southwestern Ontario. That's a total of 78 pharmacies on top of the 155 assessment centers we have around the, the province. And uh, as for uh, you know them contacting their mother, uh, if that's what I understand happened, they must have had the number somewhere. They just don't pull out the mum's name from the, the sky. So it must have been put down somewhere, but I'm going to hand it over to uh, uh, the minister. Thank you. Well, in 99% of the cases, the contact tracing can be easily done because we do have the information necessary in order to follow up on it. But there are a, a few cases that happen where maybe all the information isn't complete. Uh, they may be missing some of the essential information. I'm not saying that was the case in this situation because I don't know enough about it. But, but we follow up uh, right away. Our public health units are immediately onto contact tracing as soon as someone is diagnosed with COVID-19. We have to follow up to find out who their contacts were and that is why with the increasing volumes that we're receiving of people being tested the uh, the contact tracing has to increase as well and as the premier has said we have put a billion dollars into expanding both the the testing the lab facilities as well as the uh, contact management we are hiring another uh, 500 people to uh, to be contact tracers in the future we also have another 500 that are being provided to us through Statistics Canada. So we're increasing our force of contact tracers by 1,000 up to 3,750. Um, I anticipate that this will be sufficient to do timely investigation because that's absolutely key for contact tracing to prevent community transmission. This will be last question. Your final question comes from Colin DeMello with CTV. Please go ahead. Hi, Colin. Hi there, hi there, Premier. Um, yesterday, the Premier of Quebec uh, had announced some very targeted measures uh, affecting some of the hotspot regions in that province. I'm curious as to why the province in Ontario hasn't decided to take any measures other than restricting social gatherings and placing limits on, on restaurants. Wouldn't now be the time to perhaps close things down in some of the regions that are predominantly affected uh, to get ahead of the virus? Well, I appreciate the question. Uh, I had a good conversation. Matter of fact, two conversations with uh, Premier Legault yesterday. It's very, very different uh, Quebec than where we are in Ontario. They have a much smaller population of uh, 8 million and, and change there compared to 14.5 million. They have a lot more cases. They have 200 and I think it's 47. I got more figures going on in my head. I know it was about 247 uh, people in hospitals compared to ours, about 137. Uh, they aren't testing as, as many people, but their outbreaks are a lot uh, a lot higher with lower lower cases and lower testing. I think they they tested about 28 29 thousand yesterday. He was saying compared to our 40 thousand. Um, so I'll always take uh, the advice off the chief medical officer, and I'm going to hand it over to the the chief medical officer. Thank you. Yes, well, thank you, um, <clears throat> Colin. As the Premier said, we are, we watch and see what uh, Quebec is doing. Their situation is different, and uh, it's very hard to compare the two. Our public health measures table is looking at, have made recommendations before, and you've heard some of those announcements last week and on Friday uh, of what they have undertaken to put in place for province-wide. They're looking at other measures that could be in further enhanced. Medical officers, health in the local areas can take steps through their powers and authority to have further limitations along with their um, mayoral and council members to do ac actions there. But we're looking at what we can do to strategically address those hot spots and the hot spots in those hot spots, if you may. Where are the sources of the outbreaks? Where do we want to focus our attention rather than broad sweep? We've done some of that already. We've made impact on there and we're working with the local medical officers of health and their teams to understand what is causing your increase in your local jurisdictions and how do we assist you in that way. So the public health measures team is meeting today and I'm looking forward to some more recommendations from them that we would deal with perhaps on a regional basis and we will have some comments about that in the future. Thank you. Follow up. 
Thank you. Um, and just looking forward to October, Thanksgiving is about 13 days away. i um, wondering if the province is going to restrict Thanksgiving gatherings, and if so, um, when is that going to be communicated? Because I know a lot of people are making plans already. Uh, students might be wanting to go back home from campuses. Uh, when is the province going to communicate their plans in terms of what we should or should not be doing for Thanksgiving? Sorry, Colm. I'm going to send it back to the doc here. Thank you. Yes, we were talking about Thanksgiving and uh, Halloween and beyond as we look at these uh, times and activities when there's gatherings of people and as we said before we're asking to uh, people to get tight again on their social bubbles their circles uh, in that manner and also then to say if you're going to have a thanksgiving where you would like to maybe have a very large extended group into your location we may be asking that you would limit that and that you would keep it to, especially with those that are in part of your household and family and others so we're waiting for some further recommendations from the uh, public health measures table. Uh, we always have our standard message around Thanksgiving uh, because we have to emphasize to cook the turkey well, because we do have other outbreaks at this time, usually salmonella. And so we ask people to be careful and manage their proper procedures of handling, cooking and preparation and serving. So there's more to it than COVID, but COVID's a big thing. And we wanna make sure that we can have a true Thanksgiving, be thankful for the health we have and that of our family and friends. And then of course, you wanna look at going on further to make sure how do we set up a proper uh, festive season uh, around the Christmas time as well. So all these things are in process and we're addressing those uh, on, on each basis and trying to get the information out in a timely fashion. So we'll have some further advice uh, in regards specifically to Thanksgiving shortly. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.